tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Hey y'all, hope you enjoyed St. Patty's Day as much as I did. God knows there's nothing like spending $30 on a big slab of corned beef. Let it simmer all damn day, and you leave the kitchen for like one minute and come back to an empty crock pot. No wonder. Right, Chester. I'm sure the cat ate five pounds of corned beef, two heads of cabbage, and six potatoes in 30 seconds. Makes perfect sense. Well, at least you didn't eat the cat. Come on in, friend. We've got work to do. And luckily, I'm one of those ones who stocks up on corned beef during St. Patty's Day. <laughs> you hear that, you scaly prick? I've got four more in the freezer. Ha! Ah! Hmm. All right. You know, I was just thinking, how about visit simplyscarypodcast.com and sign up as a patron? You can get their entire catalog dating back to 2012 bad free and available to download or stream. Just click the Patrons Area tab for as little as $5 a month, and you'll get all the horror you can handle. All the horror you can handle, Big John. <clears throat> Anyhow, tonight we're joined by author Thomas O. by way of our friends at Velox Books. He's the author of two collections on Amazon, also available as audiobooks which we certainly hope you'll check out. But for now, without further delay, I give you the phantom arm of Sebastian Culpepper. I have two stories I want to tell. In each one, the main character is missing an arm. Other than that, both of these tales are quite different from one another. Yet I can't seem to separate the two in my mind, as they seem to complement each other in peculiar and disturbing ways. Our first story, the much shorter of the two, was passed on to me by my father. It starts in 1910, and it goes like this. A mill employee named Gerald Parsons suffered an unfortunate workplace accident when he stepped a little too close to the grinding equipment. The mill's gears, as strong as they were unforgiven, ripped Gerald's arm clean from his body. Surprisingly, he not only survived the accident, but he lived another 40 years working in that same mill until the day he died of natural causes. Beginning shortly after his death, if you're prone to believe in the rumors, the ghost of Gerald Parsons could sometimes be seen walking the floors of the mill. In addition to the sightings, there exists a fuzzy photograph from 1965 that purportedly shows his eerie form walking through the grinding room. Not too long after that picture was taken, the mill was torn down. Shortly after that, Gerald Parsons' existence became one based only on the memories of others, as his ghost was never seen again. Now, here's the most interesting thing about this story. All of the eyewitnesses who saw Gerald's ghost claimed that he had two arms. My father was one of those witnesses, and he too swore that on the night Gerald appeared to him, both of his upper limbs were intact. Even the fuzzy picture shows a possibly grinning Gerald with two equally fuzzy arms down by his side. So I ask you, how is it that a man who lived two-thirds of his life without his left arm suddenly reunited with it upon death? The question is completely rhetorical, because neither you nor I can know the real answer. Yet it happened. It's almost as if his arm preceded him to the afterlife and somehow waited there for the rest of him to catch up. Silly, right? 
I suppose I wouldn't have put too much thought into Gerald's story if I had never known my friend Sebastian Culpepper. If you compare Sebastian and Gerald, you'll find very few attributes in common. Gerald, earnest, hardworking, and serious. Sebastian, fun-loving, loyal, and friendly. Yet, as I touched on earlier, they do share one major quality. Both lost their left arm at a relatively young age. And that brings us to our second story. When Sebastian was 17, a heavy crate fell on his arm while he was moving some items around his attic. The injury seemed minor at first, but an unfortunate and uncommon cascade of events followed. The injury began to swell up. The swelling cut off the circulation to the arm, and then the arm tissue began to die. The pain finally forced Sebastian to the emergency room, but not soon enough. Two days after his injury, his arm was amputated. It's quite common for an amputee to still feel a limb after it's been removed. It's as if the brain still thinks the limb is attached. The phenomenon is referred to as phantom limb syndrome. Upon waking from his surgery, Sebastian could have sworn that his left arm was still present. But it was just a trick his body was playing on itself. Not only could he feel his missing arm, but it hurt too. Sebastian adjusted as best he could, and he was determined not to let his missing arm prevent him from accomplishing his goals in life. However, the pain and discomfort associated with this phantom limb was ever-present. There were different therapies that Sebastian subjected himself to, and there were painkillers too. The treatments helped somewhat, and slowly over the course of years, Sebastian's phantom limb pain improved, though it never went away entirely. I never knew Sebastian when he had two arms. I met him years after his accident when we both worked at the same office. I used to tell him that he was the coolest one-armed guy in the world. The clients loved him, and he always got a laugh by going to shake their hands and then acting like he didn't know where his arm had gone off to. Corny, yes, but somehow Sebastian made it funny every single time. The bosses all adored him too, and I can't really think of anyone who didn't like him. So it was odd when Sebastian came to work one particular Monday in a foul mood. I watched him the entire morning, uncharacteristically snapping at people for making minor mistakes and generally being a jerk. Rather than see him get himself in some sort of trouble with the higher-ups, I suggested he and I leave early for lunch. Yeah, Brian, that sounds like a good idea, he told me. Let's get out of here. It was at the restaurant where he finally clued me in to what had been bothering him. It's my arm, he said in between bites of his hamburger. It's hurting me. A lot. I looked at his right arm, the only one he still had. No, he shook his head. My other arm. But you've had phantom limb pain before, I argued. And you didn't go around acting like a complete asshole when it happened. It's different this time. He took another bite before putting his burger down. It's not random pain like in the past. I feel specific. He trailed off as he tried to think of the right words. Things. Things? I asked. I don't think I know what you mean. When I was younger, the pain was always generalized. It started here. Sebastian pointed to where his left forearm should have been. Then it moved up towards my shoulder. But now, it feels like there's something sharp stabbing me. I tell you, it's very specific. It's not like anything I've felt before. He sighed and looked right at me. And it fucking hurts. Even though I'd clearly heard him, I still sought some clarification. You're talking about your missing arm. It feels like it's being stabbed? Yeah. Stabbing. Cutting. It's like someone's trying to torture me. Do you feel it right now? He shook his head no. Usually it starts around 6 p.m., and goes for about half an hour or so. It's been like this for the past few days. 
I wasn't sure what to tell him, but I wanted to be supportive of my friend. Hey, the Lakers are on tonight, I told him. I'll head over to your place around six and we can watch together. He had a distracted look on his face, as if he hadn't heard me. Hey, I prodded. I'll bring the beer. Sebastian's stern face broke, and he gave a small smile. Sure, man. Sounds good. I got out of work late. Sebastian had gone home early at my suggestion, so I finished up some of his loose ends. By the time I got to my house and changed clothes, it was already nearing six o'clock. Traffic took up more time, and the line at the convenience store was anything but convenient. As I arrived at his apartment complex with the beer in hand, I cursed myself for not getting there sooner. I bounded the stairs up to Sebastian's apartment two at a time. When I knocked on his door, there was only dead silence from the other side. I waited a minute, then let myself in with a twist of the handle. Sebastian was lying silently on the couch. His eyes were scrunched shut and trails of wetness on his cheeks gave evidence of the tears that had run down his face moments earlier. Sebastian, you okay? He nodded silently, not to say he was okay, but to acknowledge my presence. I put the case of beer on the coffee table and stood by awkwardly. He finally spoke to me. I'm scared. It feels like the skin is being pulled off my arm. A scream erupted from his mouth as he rolled off the couch onto the floor. I stepped forward to help him, but he waved me away. I'll go grab you a Percocet, I said as I changed direction towards his bathroom, where I knew he kept his pain medication. No, I already took a couple. They aren't helping. With nothing left to do, I stood and waited helplessly as my friend struggled with his pain. For 15 minutes or more, he grimaced in agony, occasionally screaming out. Eventually, I could see a look of relief spread across his face as the pain ebbed. It stopped. Maybe the Percocet worked, I ventured. No, he responded. I think whatever it is is done for the night. Sebastian got back onto the couch and motioned for me to sit down with them. Man... It's the craziest thing, he continued. When I'm in all that pain, it feels like sometimes there's a hand grabbing onto my phantom arm. He paused for a moment after seeing my face, which must have had a strange look on it. Hey, thanks for coming out tonight. It's nice to have someone here. Yeah, no problem, Beth. Have you seen a doctor about this pain? Not since this weird shit started. But I don't know what else they can do for me that they haven't already tried. He reached for a beer and opened it before picking it up. Then he took a good long drink. He wiped his mouth before continuing. I looked it up online to see if anyone else has experienced pain exactly like this. But I couldn't find anything. I stayed with Sebastian for a couple more hours. We just talked like good friends do. It took his mind off of what he was going through. On my way out for the night, I told him that I would be back the next evening and that I would try to get there earlier. That night, as I tried to sleep, I found it impossible not to envision the pained look that I'd seen on Sebastian's face earlier that evening. The situation simply wasn't normal, and it worried me. What was causing my friend such pain? How was it possible for such a long-gone limb to have an effect on his current well-being? Finally, after lying awake and pondering his situation for hours, I willed myself to stop thinking about it. As I faded off, the story of Gerald Parsons swirled in my mind for just a moment, then sleep. Work was busy the next day, and I barely had time to acknowledge Sebastian's presence at the office so I was glad when later that evening I was able to keep my word and arrive at his apartment 20 minutes before 6. Sebastian had already taken two Percocets in anticipation of what was to come, even though he seemed to believe they didn't help. I had brought Chinese food, which I put on his dining room table. As I pulled out the paper plates, I asked a question that had popped into my head as I had drifted off the night before. So where do you think your arm is? 
A look of confusion spread across Sebastian's face. The arm they cut off? I don't know. What did they do with medical waste? That's not exactly what I'm talking about. I felt foolish for what I was about to say, but I think Sebastian already knew where my line of questioning was headed. I'm not talking about your physical arm. No, I mean, where do you think its spirit went? Sebastian managed to force out a meager laugh. I didn't think arms had spirits of their own. He didn't sound convincing, as if maybe he'd already had this same conversation with himself. Knowing his fragile state, I tried to be gentle with my words. Well, maybe that was a bad way to phrase it. But what if it's still part of your overall spirit? And it's out there waiting for you somewhere. Sebastian laughed even harder at that. Don't laugh, I said. I'm serious. My dad used to tell me a story about a man who lost an arm just like you did. After he died, people saw its ghost and it had two arms. Sebastian sat down at the table. So you're saying that my ghost arm is out there, floating around in some nether region, just waiting for me to reunite with it? Well, it sounds stupid when you say it out loud like that. I was suddenly embarrassed by my idea. Not stupid. I appreciate the fact that you're putting some thought into this. But if what you're saying is true, then that would mean my arm is waiting for me in some place that probably isn't so nice. He faded off as the implication of what he was saying sank in. I shook my head and tried to change the subject. No, it was just a stupid thought I had. Sorry I brought it up. Your arm's not waiting for you. That would be ridiculous. Sebastian was silent. I could see that the idea was gaining traction in his thoughts. Finally, he looked at his watch. It's almost six. The pain came to him the same as it had the night before. Once again, I waited helplessly while my friend writhed in agony. Sebastian, in a tortured voice, was able to describe the pain as it happened. Stabbing sensations, bones in his fingers getting snapped, a sharp instrument slicing along the length of his arm, and something grabbing onto him. After some minutes of extreme pain, it seemed he was given a temporary reprieve. <laughs> I don't feel any stabbing or breaking, he said, but I still feel warmth, like my arm's in some sort of really hot room. A new thought popped into my head. Why don't you try to move your arm? I asked. Maybe this thing works two ways. Maybe it won't hurt so much if you can mentally shift its position. What do you mean? His interest was piqued. How would I do that? Use your muscle memory. Just imagine that your arm is still attached. Then act on it. Move your fingers or something. Sebastian nodded, indicating that he took the idea seriously. Personally, I thought it was a crazy idea, but it matched the crazy situation. I gave no credence to the fact that it might actually work. Sebastian closed his eyes and concentrated. Okay, I will wait until I feel something, then I'll try it. We sat in silence as the clock seemed to tick endlessly. Sebastian was focused and ready. I twiddled my fingers, beginning to regret both the fact that I had made such a silly suggestion and that he'd bought into it. Look, Sebastian, maybe it's done for tonight. I was suddenly cut off by Sebastian's cries as the torture restarted. God, motherfucking damn. The expletives flew from his mouth as he squirmed on the couch. It seemed like for just a second he had forgotten his plan of attack but then he composed himself and gave me a nod. I could see the muscles of his stub flex as he made his motion. When I saw what happened next, I jumped from a sitting position and stood up on the couch, screaming out loud in shock and surprise. Sebastian had gotten launched from the couch. In fact, it looked more like he had been pulled off it. He landed on the floor face first, and then his whole body moved along the ground towards the other side of the living room. His stub was leading the way. 
I saw the look of terror on his face as he was dragged to the other side of the apartment by something unseen. He finally came to a stop next to the wall. What happened? I asked between breaths. <laughs> I grabbed it. I grabbed it. Sebastian was breathing too heavily to say anything more. I got off the couch and helped him up. He walked back and sat down. When he spoke, there was a tremble in his voice. I actually felt my hand as it latched onto some sort of creature. Its skin is hot and rough, and it pulled back when I grabbed it. Probably I surprised it, and it dragged me until I let go. Faced with indisputable proof that something supernatural was happening, I began shaking all over. I tried to imagine a way that it could be just a trick that Sebastian was playing, but the way he moved across the ground, no man could move like that on his own. I'd seen it firsthand. He'd been dragged. I suddenly wanted to be anywhere else. I've got to get out of here, Sebastian. This shit's just too real. I walked quickly to the front door and opened it. I don't think you should try that again. I'll call you later. I had no intention of calling him. Wait, please don't leave me alone. Sebastian looked desperate. I'll admit it. I'm fucking terrified, Brian. Yeah, I am too. That's why I'm leaving. Just don't do that again. Take another Percocet and go to sleep. Everything will be all right. Even as I spoke the words, I knew they were bullshit. Fear was firmly in control as I walked out the door. I just wanted to be alone before yet another new reality reared up and dragged my friend across the room. I raced home, turning my phone off before I even got there. I tried to sleep, but the sight of Sebastian being dragged across the room by some unknown specter kept replaying in my mind. To say I got two hours of sleep that night would be generous, so I called in sick to work in the morning. That whole day I tried to keep busy. I watched television, took some naps, read a book, and did basically anything to keep my mind occupied. As the day waned, I began thinking more and more about Sebastian, despite my efforts otherwise. I'd intentionally kept my phone off for the entire day. After sunset, I held the device in my hand and went through the motions of turning it on without actually doing so. I knew that once I powered it back up, I'd no longer be able to ignore the new world that had been opened to me. I eventually gathered the strength to turn it on. Not more than three minutes later, I got a call from Sebastian. Come over, please, now. He was desperate. What's the problem? I tried to be strong, but I immediately regretted answering his call. I could hear the horror in his voice as he answered. It started communicating with me. I quickly sat up. What? How? It's spelling things on my arm. Just get over here, please. I gathered my final bit of courage and headed over to Sebastian's apartment. He let me in as soon as I got there. It's writing things to me. I could see a tear in his eye. I could feel its claw, or whatever it is, cutting the words into my arm, letter by letter. What's it saying? Sebastian showed me a notepad that he had written on. Once I figured out what was happening, I started to write down the letters. I looked at the pad and saw what he had scribbled. Death soon. Wait for you. Mine. What's doing this to me? Sebastian quietly asked. I don't know, but whatever it is, it can't spell for shit. Sebastian looked at me incredulously and hit the notepad out of my hand. Who cares if it's a bad speller? It's damn good at causing me agony. I apologized to him. It had just been a stupid comment meant to mask the true fear I felt. I picked up the notepad and looked at it again. So this thing, it's communicating with you now. Yes. He was solemn. But why today? Why would this thing start sending you messages only now? 
I wondered that too, he replied. I think the link between me and my phantom arm is growing stronger. This thing couldn't do it before because the connection wasn't sensitive enough for me to feel the words. He looked down at his shoes. But now it is. When I grabbed it, it learned that the link was getting stronger. Getting stronger? Why would it be doing that? He motioned down to the notepad in my hands. You saw it. Death soon. The closer I get to death, the stronger the link to my arm becomes. I shook my head. You don't know that. You can't be sure. But it makes sense, doesn't it? I nodded grimly. I couldn't think of a better explanation. Is it still talking to you? Sebastian shook his head. Not anymore. I think it's done for tonight. Sebastian was right, and the thing, whatever it was that was communicating with him, didn't hurt him again that night. I went to work the next day, but my recent inability to focus on anything remained with me. I'm sure I must have lost an account due to my distracted mind, but it didn't even matter to me. Sebastian had called out sick, which he certainly couldn't be blamed for. I held off calling him during the day for the simple reason that I had no idea what to say to him. When work was done, I made the uncharacteristically bold decision to go straight to his apartment. If I went home, I knew I was unlikely to go over to Sebastian's ever again. I was scared, yes, but I knew that if I were in his position, Sebastian would never let me go through something like that alone. I picked up a pizza on the way over. When I got there, I saw a smidgen of relief grace Sebastian's face when he answered the door. He motioned me in with a sweeping arm gesture, then stepped into his living room and fell backwards onto the couch. I sat the pizza down on the table and offered Sebastian a slice as I picked up one for myself. He shook his head no. The room was quiet, except for the ticking of the clock and my chewing, which I was quickly becoming aware of. With the silence getting uncomfortable, I thought of something to ask. Sebastian, why do you think this is happening to you? He looked away from me. Lots of people who lose their arm have phantom limb pain. Yeah, but they don't get dragged across the room. I was shocked that he could somehow respond as if what he was going through was common limb pain. Sebastian didn't respond, and instead he nodded toward the clock on the wall. Six o'clock. He picked up the same notepad from the night before and placed it on the end table next to him, then grabbed his pen. With his eyes closed and in deep concentration, he was ready to write any message that came through. The next couple of minutes passed by uneventfully, but soon I could see Sebastian visibly begin to struggle with the increasing pain. Beads of sweat formed on the side of his head as his breathing quickened. It's starting? I cautiously asked. Sebastian nodded. Yeah, and my head hurts too. A headache? That's new, isn't it? Sebastian nodded yes again, then screamed out. (laughs) It's cutting into my arm! Even with the pain, Sebastian focused inward and began recording the letters that were being cut into his long-lost limb. Hello, Bryn. I stared at the paper and then screamed as Sebastian marked the final end across the paper. Sebastian's pseudo-trance was broken by my outburst. It's talking to me! I yelled as I pointed at the writing. Hello, Brian! Oh, fucking shit! I jumped away from the couch. How does it know my name? How does it know I'm here? I don't know, man. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have dragged you into this. Sebastian held his hand to his eyes as an apparent wave of pain pulsed through his head. That's it. I'm leaving. I grabbed my jacket and headed for the door. Wait, Sebastian pleaded. You ask why this was happening. It's about Carla Shavers. That's the only possible reason. I think I'm being punished. Who's that? I demanded with my hand on the doorknob. Just look it up later. 
I'm sorry it ever happened. He looked a shame as the words left his mouth. I pulled the door open and took one last look at Sebastian. Please don't leave me alone, he cried. His left eyelid pulsed as he spoke. Tears streamed from his other eye. I'll call you tomorrow. It was the last lie I ever told Sebastian. I closed the apartment door behind me and walked quickly away. As I moved down the hallway, I heard Sebastian scream out. I walked faster. He wasn't at work the next day, nor did he call our supervisors to say he wouldn't be in. I turned my cell phone off just in case he tried to call me. I felt guilty about it, but I wasn't too far from having a breakdown of my own. I mindlessly went through the motions of my job. I didn't go see Sebastian that night. The day after that, his corpse was found by another one of our co-workers who went to his apartment to check on him. The news was devastating for me. He had been a great friend, one who had never let me down. The sense of loss was compounded by the knowledge that I had abandoned him in his time of need. Even worse than that, I knew that the entity that once had only his arm probably now had him in his entirety. I vomited the first time that thought entered my mind. Sebastian's body didn't have a mark on it. It took time, but eventually the medical examiner determined that his death was due to natural causes, a ruptured brain aneurysm specifically. It was a condition Sebastian never knew he had. The time of death was estimated to be between 6.30 and 7 on the last day I saw him. So it happened shortly after I left. For a long time, I kicked around the idea that somehow his demise had been caused by the entity that was communicating with him. Yet when I thought on it longer, I remembered something Sebastian had said. The closer I get to death, the stronger the link to my arm becomes. I came to the conclusion that his death truly was natural. That thing didn't cause Sebastian's death. It didn't have to. It just waited for him and had some fun with him while it did so. I completely forgot about Carla Shavers for a few weeks. When I finally looked her up, I found that she was from Sebastian's hometown and she'd been missing for years. The last time anyone ever saw her, she was walking home from a late night party. There were very few clues about her disappearance and she had been gone so long that most people in the town considered her to be dead. It was shocking to read about, not because some poor girl had disappeared, but because of Sebastian's insinuation that he had something to do with it. I found it impossible to believe that the Sebastian I knew, with his amazingly friendly disposition, could be directly responsible for anyone's demise. But he had obviously felt guilty about something. I thought back to some of the conversations we had had about his youth, and I remembered him talking about the group of friends he ran with in high school, a time when he was less of a leader and more of a follower. Some of them weren't good people, and a couple of them were downright nasty. I ended up making peace with the fact that Sebastian had probably participated in something malicious. It probably wasn't his idea, or even something he wanted to do, but nonetheless, he was present for it. At a minimum, he had information about a missing girl that he never shared with anyone. I contacted the police in his hometown and told them what I knew, which wasn't much, really. Still, it was a lead they could follow up on. When I reported it, I kicked myself for not knowing more. If I hadn't been so desperate to run out of Sebastian's apartment on that final night, maybe I could have gotten more information from him. I saw Sebastian in my dreams every night for months. Little devils with pitchforks would run all over his arms and legs, stabbing them repeatedly. Flames would shoot up around him and cook his skin. Help me, he'd scream. The dreams became more and more vivid until one day I finally woke up with a promise on my lips to try and help him. I drove to Sebastian's hometown, which was about four hours away. 
Through my research, I knew that Carla Shaver's parents still lived in the area. I called ahead and told them that I wanted to speak to them about their daughter, and I was greeted warmly at the door. Were you a friend of Carla's, they asked. I explained to them that I never knew Carla and that I was actually a friend of Sebastian's. The police had updated them on the case, so they were already familiar with the name. Then I told them that Sebastian, with his final words, had passed along his apologies for whatever part he had played in Carla's disappearance. It was clear they weren't ready to hear it. Thank you for coming out, Mr. Shaver said rather tersely. He was obviously struggling to be polite with me. If Sebastian was ever going to be forgiven, it wasn't going to happen on that day. I couldn't think of any other way I could possibly help Sebastian, and soon my thoughts turned inward. That thing, the entity, it said hello to me. Believe me, it's a very unsettling feeling to know that something so evil has made an effort to personally acknowledge your existence. I wonder if it'll be there waiting for me when I die but maybe it was just having an easy laugh at my expense. Like so many other things associated with Sebastian's demise, I just don't know for sure. I've taken the time to carefully think back through all my sins. I know I never did anything as bad as Sebastian. Yet, when a friend needed me most, I just left him to die. I might have been able to save him. I for sure could have been there to comfort him when he passed, but I wasn't. He died alone and in fear. Some may argue that he deserved it, but for all I knew at the time, he was the same innocent Sebastian that he had always been, and there was plenty of good in him. I hope that my cowardly actions aren't enough to condemn me, and I hope that somewhere, somehow, Sebastian forgives me. And that was The Phantom Arm of Sebastian Culpepper by Thomas O. And you know what? Now it makes sense why Jeff's always complaining his foreskin burns. Huh. A little about the author. Thomas O. likes dogs, the ocean, and creepy stories. He's the author of two books on Amazon published by Velox Books, The Seer of Possibilities and Face Down in the Grave, both available on Amazon and Audible.com. Thanks, Thomas. And just a friendly reminder to check out our pals from Velox on veloxbooks.com. They specialize in the stuff you come here for, indie-style horror stories with that tangy, creepy pasta flavor. Be sure to give them a look for your next read. They've become quite the partner in crime. And do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. He needs soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and he appreciates it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at ChillinTalesForDarkNights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment, 10 bananas. Well, I'm a 
afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So grab a drink for the road. It's still St. Patty's week after all. So may the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. May the rains fall softly on your fields, and may you die in Ireland. And keep your crockpot out of reach of the family gator. Until next time, friends, go fuck yourselves. <laughs> uh, good night, y'all.